Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high quality website or blog. For a free trial and 10% off your new account for six months, go to Squarespace.com and use offer code FRAMERATE8. Something should go there in the video version. Like there should explosions. be explosions. There should be explosions, atom bombs of digital awesomeness exploding all over the universe. That's what we need. That is exactly what we need on Frame Rate episode 37. Hello, I'm Tom Merritt. Hey, I'm Brian Brushwood. How you doing, Tom? What a coincidence that we're both here to do Frame Rate at the same time. At the exact same time. Here it is. Tuesday at 4 p.m. Uh, Pacific time, and the two of us hanging out together. Because I was just, I just had this weird urge to talk movies, television, viral videos, that kind of thing. Anything with moving images, I wanted to talk to someone about. And how bizarre that you had that same urge. It's just, it's kismet. <laughs> it is kismet, as you said just before the show started. Hey, man, you ready to dive in? I am. I love the Rage Kids that we opened up with. Uh, yeah. Those of you on the audio podcast always miss out a little bit on the joke. They were all in little bumper car, like little kitty cars. Uh, I, yeah. I think what made it even funnier for me as a U.S. American, uh, US American. Is, is, a, uh, is the fact that they had the English accents. Yes. Well, it's like it's already cute. You know, kids being road ragey grownups, already cute. Add British accents. Hilarious. Yep. Makes everything funnier. People, if you've ever, have you ever been, you've been to England, right? Uh, well, no, I haven't, but thanks for rubbing that in my face. I'm appreciating that, um... How many times have you not been to England? <laughs> I, I transferred <laughs> through, uh, uh, one of their, I forget what, the, Heathrow. I transferred through, through Heathrow. So, so you've been. And, and when you were in Heathrow Airport, everything was funnier, wasn't it? Uh, I remember them saying Sully tape, and that was very funny to yep. me. I was just like, you crazy English people, this is cellophane tape. I well, was in 7th grade at the time. We're not here to talk about accents. We're not here to talk about Brian's travel habits. We're here to talk about frames and how we rate them. Let's start off with the big story. This just in, the big story. And this may be... The biggest story we've ever covered, Brian. The, it's the biggest big story. It's the biggest story. Yeah. Uh, it comes from Jonah Lehrer at the Frontal Cortex blog on Wired. A study has been done that determines that spoilers not only don't ruin your enjoyment of literature, they actually increase your enjoyment of literature. Okay. Um, wow. L say it again. Say it again slower. Just so, just so, like, say it, like, s start with the phrase, science has now proven, yes. dot, dot, and then finish that. S say it again for me. A study now suggests, I mean, no, science no, has proven. Science has proven. Science yes. has proven that a study suggests that spoilers can actually increase our enjoyment of literature. That, that's, that, that cannot be. That cannot be. How, how did they conduct this study? Uh, Nicholas Christenfeld and Jonathan Levitt of the University of California, San Diego, gave several dozen undergraduates 12 different short stories. And the stories came in three different types. 
uh, ironic twists, straight up mysteries, and literary stories, things like Updike and, and Carver, that kind of stuff. Some subjects read the story as is, without a spoiler, and others read the story with a spoiler carefully embedded in the actual test as if the author had intended it that way. The results were those who were spoiled consistently rated their enjoyment higher than those who were not of the stories. Uh, okay, and, and uh, of course the big money graphic is this one right here that we're looking at where it shows the bars in black are people who experience the story after already having had the big twist at the end mentioned in advance or the ending of the story spoiled. Uh, here's what's shocking to me. If you look in the first one, ironic twist stories, these are the ones where, you know, you find out, uh, and, and I guess we should do like a serious spoiler alert, because if we're going to talk about spoilers, let's just say that for the next few minutes, any big movie that has a twist ending. Well, is, uh, how's anybody going to know whether they should keep watching or not? If you've seen every movie ever, you can continue. It's, well, okay, okay, okay. Uh, but, but, you know, but the point of the story is... It, it doesn't, doesn't We are going to increase your enjoyment. Now, now but the, the, here's the key thing. This is literature. Is it the same in movies? We don't know. Well, okay, yes. Uh, I'm going to say yes, it probably is in, in movies and literature. I'm going to bet that for the most part, these exact same things uh, apply. But, but across the board, 100%, I'm looking, I'm trying to find one of them. Uh, the only one is in the ironic twist story, The Bet, is the only one mm -hmm. where spoiled slightly made it more enjoyable than if it was spoiled in advance. But uh, I have no idea how they phrase the questions or if they're talking about overall, like, uh, is this Rotten Tomatoes rules where it's like 90% of them thought it was positive and 10% thought negative? Or is this, a, is this a case where they took an aggregate of, of how much they love the story, that kind of thing? Uh, I'm betting it's probably the latter. Um, this, this is so difficult for me to spoil. There are certain times you have your worldview completely shaken to its very foundations because as somebody on the internet who, who has, you, I always feel the disappointment of somebody splashing a spoiler in my face. Um, and it's hard for me to believe that because of that spoiler, which I never enjoy finding out the spoiler in advance, it's very hard for me to believe that somehow I'm going to enjoy the actual product more because of that. What was your reaction when you saw this story? Uh, my, my, well, I, I actually uh, like what Angel Mercury just said in the chat room. I'm, I'm avoiding your question. Uh, there's a difference between knowing you're being spoiled and having something written in as if it's part of the storytelling. So when Bra let's take Breaking Bad, for instance. When Breaking right. Bad starts off an episode with the thing that's happening at the end of the episode, they're right. spoiling you. They're saying, this is the end of the story. And then they go, you know, f six hours earlier. And suddenly you're, you're like, oh, okay, so we got to figure out how we get to that point. When the author does it, we don't mind. But I think there's a difference, there's a, almost a pain associated with being spoiled not intentionally. So when someone says, hey, guess what? It's made of people. And you're like, what? Oh, you just ruined the movie for me. Uh, yes then, you know, that, that we, we may think the movie is ruined. We may not actually have been ruined. We may go to see that movie and get more enjoyment out of it because we know where it's going and, okay. and suspenses and everything, but so, we still have the perception of you just did something bad. So let me, let me throw this two different ways. First of all, let me put on my hat that says spoilers definitely increase the value of a movie. And uh, for you to say otherwise... If let's say there are people out there right now who are like, this is crazy talk. Spoilers definitely don't ruin a movie, or, or they definitely do ruin a movie. If that's the case, if you truly believe that spoilers ruin the movie, then explain for me why you ever bother to watch any movie twice. When you watch Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope, are you are you hoping it'll be different this time? You have had the entire movie from beginning to end 100% completely spoiled. And yet there are people who say they enjoy it more on their second, third, and fourth viewing. I can flat out say The Big Lebowski I liked the first time I, I watched it. I loved it the second time I watched it. That's what I say to people who, uh, who think that spoilers definitely ruin movies. However, let me turn to the people who did this article and say, oh, no, no, no. 
spoilers don't ruin movies. They don't ruin well, books. They don't ruin yeah, books. They, they make them better. Uh, to those people, I say, then explain to me why nobody ever goes back and rewatches a Super Bowl. Because if you know, if even if you heard, you're like, oh, I want to see that game. Pe and then people you do. How it ended. Pe people do rewatch Super Bowls. No, nobody does. Not one person in the entire universe. I asked everybody one at a time, and they all say, no, we don't go back and watch uh, Super That's Bowl. an impeccable data set. I can't, I can't argue with that. Uh, no, I, I, but, but sports in general are all, they hinge. The, the very drama of sports hinges on the unknown outcome. That's why things get so electric at the end, because you gen genuinely don't know. It's that random reinforcement. You might be hitting the lever and getting the the crack cocaine injected in your you know in your arm, or you might be hitting the lever and you're going to get a punch in the face. With sports, you genuinely don't know, and I can imagine no world in which spoilers would enhance that experience for anyone. I submit to you, ESPN Classic. Well, okay, but that's yes, but yeah, <laughs> but and is it the NHL, NFL, and MLB networks right, who okay. constantly play old games. Is it better watching it the second time? That's that's the thesis of this article, saying that. Yeah, that's, but I I I think there may be some problems trying to compare sporting events and stories. Stories are are crafted essentially to to bring you through an entertainment process. Sports may or may not be good. We don't know. It's it's they're two different things. No. I think there's different. I think there's a, an essential difference between the two that you you can't accurately compare them. I think I guess what I'm saying is it's perfectly possible that spoilers could ruin sporting events but enhance literature like movies and books. Hmm. I okay. If you if uh, I don't uh, if if I'm going to back away from all the rhetoric and just say there's something about this article that made me want very much to examine all of the testing procedures for it and how the questions were phrased. I felt I, very well on the outside. I, I still I go back to what Angel Mercury said in the chat room. I think the fact that it was in the text, which is scientifically valid to say, you know, we're not going to tip people off. We're going to just weave it in so it appears to be yeah. intentional. Okay. I think that makes all the difference. Then, no, then having someone, I think I would like to see a test where someone's about to sit down and read a short story and you have the, the spoiler weaved into the text, you have the people reading the original text, oh, yeah, and, then we ha and then we have a group of people where someone comes in and goes, hey, you know what, he dies at the end. And then what, they re and, and see if the enjoyment changes because someone was spoiled by a third party. What, what does that mean, have the spoiler weaved into the text? What does that even mean? Well, essentially what they're doing is they're saying the twist at the end of these stories or the mystery is given to you at the beginning of the story in while you're reading in the text. Okay. They didn't have somebody come in and spoil. You'd say like, oh, guess what happens? They just gave him a short story, and the short story told you the ending at the beginning instead of at the end where it was originally written. Wait a minute. Okay. Okay, so what they're saying is they took, they took the, the, the existing story and they just copied the ending and put it at the beginning well, the, the spoiler was carefully embedded in the actual text as if the author himself had given away the end. Well, well what does that mean? Uh, oh, uh, Actually, so, okay. oh, but you know what? I missed this. Some read the story with a spoiler disclaimer in the preface. So maybe they did do what I was talking about. Uh, okay. Uh, if they did the way you describe it, if what they did essentially was make a remix of an original story and somehow proclaim that that proved that spoilers were awesome, then screw you. That's not science. No, you it's, it's totally valid. They're, they're, they're actually trying to remove a, a particular effect. It sounds, it sounds like, now this is again where we actually need to find the story. It sounds like they did three things. They had some people read the original story. They had okay. some people read a story where, you know, and it was the butler who did it is at the beginning and everything else just kind of is, you know, leading you back to that would, point. Would not be a spoiler. That would, that would, that's And they had some people that's read, a, read a story with a preface saying, this is how it ends. Okay. Uh, I would say uh, that that middle one, totally not valid. I would throw out any of that stuff. No, that's val valid. You need that, actually. You need that as a control to say, well, is it just that knowing that is cool to the story? So you have, you have to represent that.
it's a good but control. the second scenario, you fundamentally change the story. Essentially, you could have started the movie Fight Club with the very beginning of, of him jumping around until he finds Ty Tyler Durden, but they didn't. The authors started the movie with a character with a gun in his mouth with another character threatening to blow his brains out. That was the story. Now, uh, likewise, it, it, you, you can't take a straight A to B story and then take a slice of B and put it at the beginning in A and act as though that was what they intended and, and somehow claim this is a study about spoilers, if that's what they did. Well, yeah, and but that, what they're saying is knowing the ending doesn't ruin the enjoyment of the story, and that's okay. perfectly valid. Uh, I, I would... I would Question. Uh, see, now that I'm hearing it put this way, I would really question whether or not I'm going to say that anything when you sit down to experience something. And, and first of all, I would question their whole use of spoiler in this world, because spoiler is when you go into it wanting to experience the intended artwork as, as it was written and instead have your experience altered against your will when somebody tells you something that's coming in up, up uh, you know, ahead in the story. That is spoiler. When say you know a, a story that begins with a flash forward and then a flash backward, that's that's a mode of storytelling. So yes, what this proves to me, if that's the case, is that number one, previews enhance your enjoyment of a story because you know what the rules. No, are. No, no, previews are different than this. That no, a trailer doesn't. It doesn't. This is saying this is the ending. This is the tension twist mystery ending being given at the beginning. I'm with you to say like it's a different kind of spoiler, and it, and it's arguable whether it's what we think of when we say the term spoiler. Because if an author does it intentionally, like Chekhov is a master at this, right? All of right. his stories start with the end. You already know where that's, it's going. All they're saying is, is they're, they're, what they're trying to point out is knowing the ending doesn't in itself, in and of itself, ruin your enjoyment of something. That, well, in yeah. fact, the tension of not knowing may detract from your enjoyment of it. Ah, uh, okay. But, but then, then stop using the word spoiler. Because to me, a spoiler is, when I think of spoilers, I think of important changes in the story that are some of the best part of the movie or the book or the television or whatever it is. It's, it's something that's so precious and awesome in that it surprises you. And that's one of the things that we seek the most is, is um, uh, and I'd hate to go back, uh, a, a few years ago, Teller from Penn & Teller wrote me an essay talking about how the heart of all great magic was surprise. And the way he phrased it, I fell in love with. He said, put two and two in front of me and convince me it's five. Then reveal the truth, four, and voila, you have true surprise. That to me are the is the essence of what a spoiler is. Is when when all the elements are laid in front of you, and you would have this awesome moment of artistic transformation. And when somebody in advance says, "Oh, you're going to read that book," where at the end you find out that two plus two equals four, then it fundamentally robs you of the ability of having that magical transformation. That is a spoiler. Finding out who who killed the guy or whatever the ending is, especially with these convoluted ways that they're expressing it, that. I, I don't know that I would call that spoiler. This, this to me, is a study in talking about... Well, you could redefine spoiler to not mean what the study is about. That doesn't change the fact that there's valuable information in this study, which is just knowing the ending is not going to ruin a story for you. I mean, yes. you can call, call it what you will. Uh, well, I, uh, yes. Uh, well, yes. But, I, but, but again, like, like t the, the, the flat statement that... Exposing spoilers doesn't ruin movies, but actually, or, or doesn't ruin stories, but instead makes them better. I would, I would really like to be specific on the language about that because I can't imagine that Sixth Sense is better going into it when you know. I would say not even if you know what the twist is, but even knowing that there's a twist coming up, I would say reduces your ability to enjoy the movie. I disagree. And, and maybe, maybe Sixth Sense is an exception. I don't know. But I disagree. I think you could still get a lot of enjoyment and possibly more enjoyment knowing the end because there's plenty of stories that are told that way. Where this I, twist, and surprises are actually only fun for the people who plan them, not for the people who get them get surprised. Surprise okay, is I, actually I, a defense mechanism. Uh, and it's, it's kind of like a thrill ride and it's a shock. But what's more enjoyable is seeing a story unfold. And, and in fact, getting, knowing the ending doesn't get rid of all the surprises. You still don't know how you got there. It's the okay. journey that's important. If it's a well-told well story, it can survive that twist ending being known. 
But when you are given a piece of information that you should not have at the beginning of the story, it fundamentally distracts you from the story. I want to get caught up in the story and, and not even see certain things coming because the character didn't see those things coming. That's what I want to experience. And when somebody But what about, the, what about those episodes of Breaking Bad where you know where it's going because they told you right at the beginning? You don't yeah. enjoy those? Oh. That's not a spoiler. But that it's is, the same damn thing because no. you know. No, because because it is the artist's intention to tell a story. Uh, it doesn't matter what the artist's intention is or not. You're saying that you just said you can't enjoy it because you're not following along with the character. But if you okay, know uh, it, you know it, whether it was intentional or not. Okay, so, and, and first of all, spoiler alert to anyone who hasn't seen Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. A buddy of mine, crazy fan of Star Trek, shows up. He's got the popcorn. He bought his tickets in advance. He's going to go see the second Star Trek movie that he's hearing amazing buzz about. He shows up. He runs into an old girlfriend who says, oh, you're going to see Star Trek too." I cried when Spock died. And so sure enough, he goes in, spends the entire movie with a ruined experience, a spoiled experience. Every time there's a battle, he's not thinking, how are they going to get out of this? He's thinking, is this part where Spock dies? How on earth is that a better experience as a result of that spoiler? Because that he's got suspense in every moment. Is this the part? Is it happening? Is this when it's going to happen? Now, I will grant you that it's a different perceptual experience when someone else tells you and you don't think that intentionality is there. But I won't agree that just the knowing is the problem. It's actually what's going on in your own head. I'm, I'm going to say that there is a difference between telling a story and your storytelling method using uh, premonitions of what is to come. That is an established uh, storytelling model that's been around for a long, long time. I think to infer from that, which is a very successful technique. We saw it, I mean, you know, Slaughterhouse Five, you know, all kinds of movies, Breaking sure. Bad. Yeah, stuff. exactly. Uh, 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 you know, Lost, you name it, right? I think that is a successful storytelling technique that is good. I think looking at that and verifying that that is a good trick to increase your enjoyment of a story, I think to make the leap of saying, well, that means spoilers are good, is completely asinine and a gigantic leap. I, I fundamentally disagree with I that. I think it's a prejudice. I think that we actually just get mad when we get spoiled because we think someone's messing with us and that we prejudice ourselves in, and into not enjoying something that if, in fact, we had been told in a different way, the same exact information, we would enjoy the movie more. I will stand up right now and proclaim myself a champion of surprise. And if you think somehow it's better to not have surprise, then I'm afraid I'm not on the same team with you on this one. I, th I think that you are not ruined. I think people should stop this idea that somehow you're oppressed because some idiot spoiled something, that they've ruined your enjoyment and you can't see the movie now. That guy who, saw, who knew about the end of Wrath of Khan should have just set that aside and said, you know what, I'm still going to enjoy this uh, because now I'm going to be wondering how it happens. I've had that experience where you know something, you find out inadvertently. I think it's when someone, it, uh, when someone intentionally spoils you, that sucks and it makes you feel bad because you feel the meanness of it. But an unintentional spoiler can actually, you can still enjoy the movie just as well, if not more. You saying, are you saying that if we made a pact and I promised every weekend to call and tell you how every movie you're about to see ends, somehow you would thank me for this? No, no. I th I'm saying it's the inadvertentness of it that's important. I think even myself, I'm not, I'm not accepting myself from this. When someone intentionally spoils, you get angry and you're just like, oh, why did you do that? And so if, I wouldn't make that that opinion known. I wouldn't say, yes, please spoil me, because it's going to make me angry, and I know that. It's just, it's just human nature. But the okay. fact of the spoiler itself, outside of how it happens in our human emotions, actually doesn't reduce the enjoyment of the story. Okay, so I'm gonna, let, me, let me try this on for size here. You use Breaking Bad as, a, as an example. One thing Breaking Bad has been very good about is giving you the illusion I, I, or an accurate depiction of something that happens down the road, but intentionally crafting it in such a way to mislead you 
to like, oh, well, this guy's clearly going to kill himself because he's so freaked out. That's why he's given this, you know, video testimony to his family before he blows his brains out. But then when you actually get there, you see the exact same footage, but you see it in a different context. And you're like, okay, now I understand. That's not how it is at all. I think you're talking, I think you're confusing foreshadowing with no, split. no, I'm not confusing. No, that's a good point. No, it's it's it's. Let's make this clear. That's because that's a that's a possible point of confusion. I'm not talking about foreshadowing. I'm talking about when intentionally you know exactly what's going to happen, but you don't know how you're going to get there, and that and that whether it's intentional or unintentional can in, in improve the enjoyment. It won't every time, but it can improve the enjoyment. I think what reduces your enjoyment is feeling like somebody was trying to undermine you. That somebody was try was trying to ruin it. Well, and 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 I actually that's a really good point because I do believe so much. Uh, having something spoiled for you is such a personal experience that you feel a resentment to the individual who, in an effort to make himself feel superior to you in that brief moment, decided to crap all over the experience you're about to have. And then, uh, and likewise, maybe you project that over to somebody who inadvertently does it. But let me do this. And and spoiler alert. Uh, I don't know, plaid for, for anybody reading the Dark Tower series. I'm not going to give anything away about the end, but, but here's how sensitive I am about spoilers. I felt spoilers. I felt spoiled when my mom called me after she finished the Dark Tower series. And all she said was, oh, I just read the end of the Dark Tower and I never saw it coming. It was so good. Like, just here, I hadn't gotten there yet, but I knew. From that point on, that it was that there was going to be something novel about the end, I, and I spent a whole last sure. third of the book trying to figure out, and I couldn't help it. I couldn't switch my brain off. And I know if I was a better person, he was like, "Oh, we should have just relaxed and gone along for the ride." Well, screw you. I couldn't because I was so wrapped up in what is going to be novel, what is going to be novel, and I'm disappointed to announce I totally called the ending like 40 pages in advance. And, and that, that has reduced your enjoyment. You don't recommend it to anyone. You haven't encouraged me to okay. read every off-series book. It's, it's, it's just ruined it for you. Well, okay, well, and, and it, it certainly has not. It, it, it did dampen my finale experience because she, she opened her present and shouted, this is a great present. And then, and that's fine. But then she felt the need to pick up the phone and call me and say, you're going to open up and it's going to be this. Or, or there's going to be something inside. And it's like, I, I wanted the surprise. I wanted not knowing. And I felt robbed of that experience. All right. Well, we should, we should definitely move on. But just so you know, there's an amazing twist at the end of Frame Rate. Let's move on to Film <laughs> Film. <laughs> Well, the movie World War Z has been totally spoiled for me. <laughs> because you read the book, right? Well, yeah, exactly. I read the book, and I was very excited that they were going to come out with a movie version of this book. Because if you don't know, uh, and this is spoiler alert, blue. Spoiler alert, yeah. <laughs> but it, uh, it, it is a documentary approach. So the idea is that someone is going around and interviewing people about their experiences during the zombie war. So I'm assuming, hey, we're going to get something similar in this movie. Here's the official synopsis from Paramount. The story revolves around United Nations employee Jerry Lane, who traverses the world in a race against time to stop the zombie pandemic that is toppling armies and governments and threatening to decimate humanity itself. Well, and, and I don't think you went quite far enough to explain. The book is about the aftermath. It takes place in the aftermath of well, zombie war. Yes and no. They're going around getting people's recollections. So some of the recollections are taking place in the war. Right, correct. But they're all looking back. That, what, that, that there's almost a detachment to it because even in the stories that are taking place, talking about the epic failure in the uh, Colorado mountains or whatever, or talking about how from the beginning they didn't know what kind of weapons to use against the zombies, but eventually they figured out the right way to take them out, that kind of thing. There's, there's part of what made this a successful story is the tone of these were, st were told in the way that you hear people talking about the Vietnam War, about World War II, that sure. kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After the fact, that is a very specific tone that made this book successful, right? And instead, what they want to do is tell it real time about a virus exploding, about somebody racing against It's a time. race against time. Yeah, which, uh, which essentially what it means is uh, instead of doing what was 
and a very original idea with a very specific execution and a very specific voice that made it super successful among its passionate fans. Instead, we're going to tell a story that's very, very familiar, very, very Hollywood, and to me, very, very boring. <sighs> yep. Pretty much. <laughs> unless, they, unless, I, unless I get some more information, I'm not even going to bother seeing this thing. At least till well, it comes to Netflix or something. Now, now this, uh, and of course, the, the story as, as we're talking about it is uh, the real story is not just that uh, Hollywood, Hollywood buying a property and then deciding to tell the story in a very generic way is, is not new news. Of course, the new news here is the geek uprising about people who have a reaction just like yours, Tom, where upon hearing this, they're like, and my interest just went to zero and I don't have anything to do with it. I've seen uh, this movie before. Well, and, and specifically what shocked me is uh, Hollywood, uh, in terms, especially in terms of television, I thought was entering a renaissance where they came to understand that maybe they should be respecting the source material. For example, The Walking Dead stayed very no perfect true to the comic book, both in tone and in what happened with minor changes. Uh, and uh, same thing with Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones respected the source material. and that's Well, uh, you're talking about television studios, AMC and HBO versus movie studios. Maybe that's the difference. I don't know. Yeah. Well, and, and maybe it'll be a, a bottom-up revolution, hopefully. We'll see. All right. Netflix is giving kids and their parents a new reason to embrace uh, internet video subscriptions. So says Associated Press. Uh, Brian Brushwood, just for kids tab has been added to subscribers' accounts on Netflix website. Does this uh, does this please you as a father? Absolutely, dude. And not that I would have canceled my Netflix subscription anyway, but uh, dude, this is exactly the kind of thing I want because I've talked about this. I've talked about how if it were up to me, if I was a total cord cutter, I would just have my kids look at YouTube, but they end up looking at parody movies with uh, you know with filthy words dubbed over instead. I sound like an old man. Like I don't want my kids hearing the filthy words. And when Todd Yellen, uh, who, who speaks in a normal tone of voice, by the way, uh, said that Netflix is not using this as an opportunity to raise rates. A lot of people are like, oh, they're going to add this separate queue, and then they're going to charge you per account that uses different queues. But no, they're just putting this in on streaming to say, hey, you know what? You can create a queue for your kids so that right. only kid-friendly movies are in there, and then your kids can log in, and then they'll only see the safe stuff, and you don't have to sit there, look over their shoulder all the time. No, that's great. Look, and, and here's the thing. Spoiler alert. Um, you don't actually have to play the spoiler alert sound. But uh, spoiler alert, Netflix is just going to continue to grow its library, and it's going to continue to offer superior service as it continues to grow. I mean, it's the right idea for the right Doesn't time. Doesn't mean they won't charge in the future sometime, but they're saying they won't do it now. Yes. Well, yes. Agreed. Uh, but, but I mean, the overall trend, and, and I'm talking about pretty much anything for the Internet when it comes to information content, the overall trend seems to be that, in general, quality goes up and prices go down. So I would say, you know, unless Netflix has some special lock or monopoly, I would expect to see more of the same for them. Are we going to do the summer movie We're draft gonna try. intro now? Yeah. Or aren't we? Yes, we are. Guess who's not in last place anymore? Dude! I'm telling you. Guess sorry, Jason. Is. Yeah, sorry, it hurts Jason's a little bit. Jason's in last place. I feel, I feel a little bad. That's not Jason. It hurts. That's, that's Jason. Right there. <laughs> Eat that, that Jason. dark thing in the Sorry, lower right. right corner. Yeah. It's all right. Somebody had to do it, right? Uh, well, yeah, so uh, Rise of the Apes did well in its second week, uh, as did Smurfs in 3D. So I'm Rise of the Apes now at 108 million, Smurfs 3D 104 million. I'm feeling better about not ending up in last place at this point. Uh, dude, I'm telling you, you have been an apologist for Rise of the Apes since the very beginning when you bought the dang thing, right? Mm -hmm. And I, and as we've gotten closer, I keep saying, like, you're underestimating. You're underestimating it. Well, you no, have, I, I started feeling good about Rise of the Apes until my wife said, eh, that doesn't look very good to me. And then I'm like, uh-oh, she's, she's the audience that needs to – she's the swing vote for Rise right. of the Apes. She ended up wanting to go see it, and she loved it. So Dude, I, it, I, because I had nothing to worry about. Great. I mean, I'm telling you, it's number one, the biggest surprise of the summer, and maybe my vote for the best. Hey, movies. but don't, don't you know what I have been defending consistently against slings and arrows is the Smurfs 3D, which <laughs> actually has got almost the same gross as right or do, same domestic as Rise of the Apes. Oh, absolutely. But the difference is, oh, and you and you got it for a bargain. You got Smurfs for nine dollars. Yeah. It's You're, actually the number two bargain and Rise of the Apes number three, which Rise yeah, of the Apes well, only got for 10. 
Yeah, I'm telling you, man, you you did great for for as for as miserable as you looked a couple of weeks ago, g- proclaiming defeat. I think you're turning out really good. And I got I'll that good what, second I week. Was, That's huge. I was totally, totally rooting for you because if if Rise of the Apes hit number one again, that meant that Final Destination Five wasn't making money, and it meant that. Um, uh, or I guess, yeah, that was the big one. Because mainly Cargill's my only threat to overtake me on number two at this point. Yeah, uh, it does not look good for Cargill now. Although he has Conan the Barbarian, which comes out Conan this Friday. Like $110 million to, to overtake me, which maybe that can happen. I don't know. Conan could do it, but it's not getting good reviews. So it, it all depends. Final Spy Destination always does pretty good. What's that? Final Destination steri- series always does pretty good. Yeah, you but this is five. To, and sequels always does. do a little bit less yeah. well in, in general than the previous version. So he's it's at already, 19 million. He's, he's not going to get much more out of that. He'll yeah. get some out of Conan. Spy Kids 4 could surprise, I think. Jason, Jason yeah. could catch me. I, I don't know. I don't know if I'm catching anybody. I'm pretty far back there at this point. And Spy Kids would have to do really well. And it just, uh, just I don't know. We'll see. My kids are watching the crap out of the Cartoon Network stuff, and my daughter knows the title, and she's gone back and watched all of the Spy Kids movies, and she's already asking me to take her to go see it. She's like, there's a fourth movie called All the Time in the World, and I'd like to go see that, Dad. Yeah, and and you know what? It could do as well as Smurf, so I wouldn't write Jason off. Uh, I could end up back in last place, but I actually think... Smart also Spy Kids thing is also... That's in Smell-O-Vision. Yeah, yeah. It's that extra D... Yeah, now, the extra I, I'm actually getting pretty excited about our winter uh, draft, dude. That we'll be doing in what? In what? Like a month? A couple months. Yeah. yeah. Because I, I feel like I learned a lot about the strategy here. I, I picked the right movies. I didn't bid strategically well. That was my, my okay, big flaw. Here's what I love is you've gotten a taste of it now. And I love the fact that we're even inventing having a winter league now because it's so infectious. And speaking of which, we should remind everybody who gets bored of us talking about it every every month, you guys can play along. As a matter of fact, in the chat room, people are, are bragging, saying that uh, Patrick Delahanty, P. Delahanty, who, uh, uh, you know, a longtime friend of the Twitch show here, is currently in number four because you guys get to take our prices and construct your own league and compete in the chat realm league. Right now, Dizzle is number one with $956 million. P. Delahanty has $927 million. But here's the thing. Uh, uh, oh, he, yeah, he still has Rise of the Apes and the Smurfs, which are both making money, and the changeup as well, which I don't well, think Well, look at Angel gonna... Mercury up there in number two. Yeah, the, oh, no, the changeup as well. Yeah, it's looking really good for Angel Mercury and Todd. Mm. I'll tell you what, man feels good to see some of the uh it, whenever i feel guilty about my picks i go back and i look through the chat realm picks and i'm like well at least i'm not this guy <laughs> clearly yeah, no i use them as a morale boost in advance <laughs> all right let's take a uh, quick break and thank our sponsor squarespace.com the fast and easy way to create a high quality website or blog if you want to make a fan site for a movie if you want to speak out against the the you know the state of the internet if you want to express your fandom your outrage your opinions go to squarespace start a website right now it's super fast super easy all you got to do is put in a name and you've started you don't need a credit card to try it out uh you can use all of the of the uh aspects of it that you want uh, they, and, and you can explore and find out what all the plans are and what the megabytes are that you get with the different plans. Uh, but it doesn't cost you a cent. So go use it. Bring in your old blog. See what it looks like. Use their templates. They've got amazing templates. They've got amazing graphic artists over there. Uh, and you will have a fast and easy website. I think they'll want to keep it. In fact, if you do, you only need to use the code framerate 8 it rhymes, so it's easy to remember when you, uh, when you check out. When you use that code, when you, when you buy the service, you get 10% off for six months. So don't worry about having to pay, pay for it yet, though. Go to squarespace.com, try out, set up a blog, see if you like it. And, but if you do, and if you do decide to keep it, use that code, frame rate 8, uh, when you check out for 10% off for six months. We thank Squarespace. I mean, we can't thank them enough for their support of frame rate. Uh, you know what? We ought to make a site. Thank you, squarespace.squarespace.com. And I'll do it for free because, I, you know, two-week trial, and they don't ask for a credit card or nothing. Exactly. On to Tube Tops. Uh, AMC 
and Sony have reached a deal for the graceful exiting of Breaking Bad. Uh, you could also say Breaking Bad's been canceled. Now it's time for <laughs> feedback. It's not time for feedback, Tricaster. <laughs> Stop it. All right. A lot of people don't know that there are upset people. to do with this thing. Oh, trying to rush song. us. <laughs> Outside of AMC. Okay, so yes, uh, production on the final 16 episodes of Breaking Bad will begin early next year. It has not been scheduled for air, but yes. So Breaking Bad is assured a an ending. Yes. But and it's well, also assured an ending. Like, yeah, well, uh, now here's, here's the thing that stuck out with me on this, because we talked about, uh, I, I assume we talked about on the show, that Frank Darabont has been essentially fired from The Walking Dead, right? Did we talk about that yeah, last we week? Yeah, we did. We have to. We have mentioned yeah. that. AMC essentially has three superstar shows, right? You got Mad Men, you got Breaking Bad, and you got The Walking Dead. Um, Walking Dead last week, we talk about Frank Darabont, who's super talented director, who everybody working on the show clearly loved, who uh, had some kind of breakdown. And after he left, he blamed, or, or sources close to him said, that it was the, the they spent so much freaking money on Mad Men. And you, you hear that once, and you think, okay, well, maybe that's a case where somebody's just got sour grapes, and you blame the bigger kid on the block. But now, they came, they're coming for, for, for Breaking Bad, where it's like negotiations got so bad that they started to put out feelers, Sony Television put out feelers to other networks saying, hey, if this doesn't work out with AMC, you want to have, you want to take Breaking Bad, we'll jump over. And so AMC does this, you know, 15 episode like wrap it up people we got a lot of checks to write to one don draper and it's like i'm i'm super i'm a little bit annoyed and maybe it's because i haven't been sucked all the way into Mad Men the way everyone else has i i barely have finished episode or season one but uh i'm really pissed to watch two shows like at some point it stopped sound it stopped sounding like crazy talk that maybe Mad Men is just eating up too much of the AMC budget and other shows are having to suffer for it. Yeah, but you know, I mean, if Mad Men is eating up a lot of the budget, it's because it makes a lot of money. So No, no. The very definition of eating up the budget means that there's less budget for everyone no, else. No, but, 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 okay, maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe AMC is, is idiotic and runs its business like, like dumbasses. But more than likely, the only reason that they spend a lot on Mad Men is because it makes a lot of money. Well, yes, and that's that, that, and again, we get into this, it's like, I understand, a show like Breaking Bad is going to be riskier than a show like Mad Men, and a show like The Walking Dead is going to be riskier than a show like Mad Men, uh, but this is why we get turds like, uh, like Transformers 3, because Hollywood loves predictable money factors. Wait a minute, so you're calling Mad Men a predictable money maker? Yes, it is a predictable money maker. You, have a, you don't even watch it. You can't say I, that. Mad Men is so not you, what you're talking you, about. You can predict that it will make money. I'm not saying the episodes are predictable. I'm yeah, saying that. Yeah, but you're 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 ca you're money. casting aspersions on predictable money makers and throwing Mad Men in the same class with like How I Met Your Mother. No, well, okay, well, and again, there's a reason those are on network television. I'm saying I'm saying yeah. it's money in the bank for Mad Men. If if if. Three I don't children. think there's some moral issue here between Mad Men and Breaking Bad. They're both risky, and they're both edgy. No, okay, they're both edgy, but they're not risky. I guarantee you there is so much less. I mean, there's a reason that they're giving the money to Mad Men. They, they measured the risk, and they said, well, we don't yeah, know. So, so money they're conducting their business in a reasonable manner, is all you're saying. Uh, well, okay, well, look, I'm saying. I, it I'm comes say down to what you're saying, it sounds like, is you wish more people watched Breaking Bad. Well, yes, I do, because if Breaking Bad was pulling in crazy money, this would not be an issue. And the yeah. same thing for The Walking Dead. Although this is the part that messes me up. Walking Dead broke records for how much it captured the 18 to 24 demographic. It was, it was the highest watched cable show in history. And then, they, and then they, still, they still say, oh, budgetary, blah, 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 get out of here, Darabont. I mean, it's like it's, it drives me nuts. And, and maybe I think there was more going on than budget there. But uh, people throw out budget as a smokescreen when they don't want to tell you the real reasons. So I'm not well, saying budget wasn't a reason, but, yeah, I think there may have been some personality conflict. That's what I thought the first time as well. But then it happened again with Breaking Bad, and that's what has me bummed. Right. I didn't mean this to take as much time as it did, by the way. <laughs> uh, Fox has formally kicked off its great uh, Go Watch Some Movies on BitTorrent campaign, also known as we are going to delay putting our shows up on the web for eight days unless you're a Hulu Plus subscriber uh, or a Dish TV subscriber. <laughs> so we can reframe this as Fox to Internet. 
Go, BitTorrent, go. I, I mean, yes and no. I, I, I should, you know, you can legitimately pay for Hulu Plus and watch the Fox shows right after they air. Uh, this is the way Hulu Plus is actually supposed to work, right? The problem is that Hulu Plus is just a mess. You actually don't know what you're getting. This is the first reasonable thing you would get, which is like, oh, if I pay the $7 a month, I get to watch the shows immediately. But not all the shows, only Fox shows. And it's just, it's just pushing people into giving up on doing the right thing. ABC is apparently going to be doing the same thing, although they're talking about authentication more. Fox is only authenticating with Dish. ABC's talking about, well, if your cable company you know, signs on and you authenticate, then you'll be able to watch shows immediately. Uh, but it really is a mess. Like, I understand why they're doing it. They're trying to keep the cable companies happy. The cable companies say, look, we don't want you driving people to the web because we want them to continue to have their cable subscriptions. We don't want them to cut the cord. And that makes right. sense for them to say that. Uh, right. But there needs to be a stiffer opposition to say, well, we're going to put this on wherever people can watch it. It's not like we won't offer it on a competing cable company because somebody could go use that. We're not going to pull channels off of DirecTV because you, Comcast, would like people to go there. So the Internet needs to be seen as a competitive cable company it just isn't yet it's 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 right now in the early stages you can play fast and loose it's going to take time to build up the habits the money the advertising budgets to make it happen in the meantime we're going to see ridiculous weird stuff like this where it's like oh now suddenly i have to wait eight days so yeah. i you know i might as well do the wrong thing and go to some streaming site and watch it where you don't get any money for it uh, you know what? This just in. We got a special report here. The Internet just released this press release targeted to Fox and all the companies that want to hold off longer. The answer is... Grip tuck. The more star systems will slip to me off in that's all I can think of is Princess Leia saying that the more you tighten your grip, the more star systems will slip through your fingers. You know what? Nobody, uh, nobody is cutting the cord, Brian. It's the economy. What do you, uh, Those star oh. systems aren't slipping through our fingers. They're just... Going out of business. <laughs> You're just going the other way. All right, can yeah. we talk about pornography instead? Uh, yeah, real quickly. I, you know what? I actually didn't put this story in the lineup at first because I was like, eh, it's, this is an Apple story. But essentially, Cinemax has an iPad app, and a lot of people think it violates Apple's no porn policy. But, you know, that's why they call it Skinemax. Uh, and it, it allows you, if you are a Cinemax subscriber, it's like HBO Go, it allows you to watch the Cinemax shows on your iPad. The, the, the controversy, of course, here is, is that, uh, because when I first read this, I was like, well, this is stupid. It, you know, Cinemax is no more a porn app than Safari is a porn app because you can go out and get pornography on the web or whatever. But specifically, Cinemax is an approved application and it actually has a tab that says Cinemax After Dark. And I thought that was an interesting. It'll be interesting to see where, uh, where this develops in there. Yeah, it, it's, it's another one of these stories. We cover them on Tech News Today a lot, which is Apple's got rules about its app store that it applies in ways that some people see as inconsistent. Yeah, exactly. What are you uh, watching there, Fringe Watcher? Dude, it's got to be Fringe, 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 and more Fringe. And I'm still, and I understand, right now I'm still back in the procedural land of Fringe. Where yeah, every you're still week in the first season, huh? Right, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm like uh, starting episode nine of, of the season right now, but it's enough where I'm, a, you know, I'm able to do one or two a day while I'm doing other stuff. But, but I'm starting to see it get more and more interesting, where it's harder for me to leave it open. Oh, that's good. All right. Other things. I'm just like I keep finding myself pulled into it, and so I'm, I'm waiting for it to get those hooks in, and I know when it does, it's just going to be an insane roller coaster. All right. But it's like, I'm, I'm starting to become real characters to me. I'm glad, even though you decided to plow through every episode, that you're not getting pushed the other way. That's good. No, 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 no. I am, and I'll, I'll tell you what, of the monster episodes, my favorite one is the one I just finished with the parasite around the guy's heart. That's some engaging storytelling. I enjoyed that a bit, quite a bit. I, I have got to give another plug to Haven. I just, I love the show. I actually went and read The Colorado Kid as if I hadn't read enough Stephen King plowing through the entire Dark Tower series. I went and read The Colorado Kid short story that it's based on, which is a cool story. Uh, yeah. But it's, it, it has really very limited relation to the show. 
Uh, yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of a throwaway to the show. There's two characters from the story that are in the show and are totally different in the show than they are in the short story. Uh, but it's just, it, it is so underappreciated. I, I, I just want to plug it out there. If you haven't tried Haven, give it a shot. I'm also caught up on Torchwood now, and that show is treading water. I am so disappointed with it. You're talking, like, you're talking about the American... Yeah, route. Miracle Day. Torchwood Miracle Day. Yeah, wow. I'm so... Uh, I mean, you strike me as somebody who would in general... Uh, let me put it this way. From where I'm standing, you have been an apologist for what I have found to be not-so-good science fiction shows. So to hear you call it and be like, this is bogus, especially a property that you want so much to love... Uh, that's kind of saying something. What is it you that know, that? I, I'm, I'm a big fan of the of the of the uh, franchise. I love Gwen. I think she's a fantastic character, uh, and I even like Captain Jack. He's not my favorite, but he's good. And there's just points where it's like, okay, it's getting good, it's getting good, and then they'll just do some ham-handed plot shift. That's like, really? That's the that's <laughs> the line your guy's gonna say, or you're just gonna bail and like. Oh, well, I guess it was all a dream. I mean, they haven't done that, thank goodness, but it's oh, almost goodness. that bad at times. And then they'll get going. They'll get, their, they'll get their momentum up, and you're like, oh, okay, this is, this is getting interesting. Now we see the secret ploy, you know, and they've been alluding to some, some, you know, the powers behind the powers. And there's finally been some actual science fiction showing up recently in hints, but they're just taking so long to get to it. It's it's How really kind of a drab CSI kind of thing with a thin veneer of torchwood on top. Hobbit from PA makes the bold claim that uh, the Americans ruined torchwood. What would you say to that? I would say, well, since it's still Russell T. Davis in charge, it wasn't us. <laughs> it was just, it just happened in our house and for it's, our audience. It's BBC Wales in conjunction yeah. with stars. So maybe you're wanting to blame stars, but it's the same people in charge of the uh, of the producing that have always been in charge. So I don't know. I love putting hand grenades like that because I'm watching chat room explode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm also just quickly watching Eureka, Warehouse 13, True Blood. I'm even watching Entourage. It's the last season. It's only a half now, hour. That's like candy. It's throwaway. Uh, well, and, and it's like, uh, like, were you caught up on Entourage? Yeah, and yeah, I was. Okay. So it's a, like I, I dropped off after season four or whatever. I, yeah. I all of a sudden I just lost I'm watching it. it out of inertia at this point. It's not bad enough to make me stop. Yeah. So. Well, um, and, and you want closure. You like the characters. And you, of, you, well, you on. know, you get invested after seven or eight seasons. So. Sure. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. And of course, I'm watching Breaking Bad, which I've got this strange feeling like I'm still not caught up because the story is so darn consistent. Yes. I can't yes. think in my mind where one season ended and another began. I feel like I'm just still watching the backlog, even though it's a new one every week. Are you, are you still liking it? Are oh, you still I love it. it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, I, I especially liked, uh, there were some dramatic changes. Uh, and as they, I'll tell you what, when the show started, I thought Jesse Pinkman was going to be the least interesting character. But I think where I'm at now is he is the most interesting character to you me. You know, Eileen with, was saying during the writer's strike, they considered killing him. Uh, killing Pinkman, and and they uh, decided not to because the actor was too good and they didn't want to waste his talent. He really is. I mean, didn't he didn't he go up for an Emmy or did he win an Emmy for Best Supporting Actor? That I he don't should? know. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes, he did. Sarah Lane says. Awesome. All right. Um, well, that's it uh, for what we're watching on the tube. Let's move on to interfacts. So this first story, I'll be the first to admit, this first story is 100% absolutely self-indulgent. We, I just couldn't resist, uh, you know, uh, guest on NSFW, frequent contributor to Twit, uh, Will Harrison, uh, Channel Flip, is now the biggest UK broadcaster on YouTube. Um, nothing much to say about that except for Well done, Will Harris. They now well have 1.2 million subscribers generating 320 million views boasting a combined monthly reach of only of over 4.4 million viewers so former employer of our very own tech news today's i as actor oh i didn't know that he that's did channel cool. flip web that's awesome well the uh uh I'll, I'll tell you and this also self-indulgent but for a totally different reason somebody sent in let me get the name of the guy who sent this in um i don't have it somebody over twitter hit me up with uh, all it said on there was like, hey, weren't you asking for this? 
And, and when I clicked on the link, it was a link to a Life Hacker article that says Kiddos TV is a kid friendly online video aggregator. Essentially, what it is is it's a front end that allows your kids to get the YouTube experience. In other words, just click from this clip to that clip, jumping all around, uh, but within a safe environment. And of oh, course, it's with a Z, Kiddos. Kiddos, that's right. Kiddos TV. Let me see if I can get the actual URL for you guys right here. Kiddos.net. Kiddos.net. Have you tried it out yet? No, no, no. I haven't tried it. I just pull it up here. In I'm fact, I'll show you, it this, right there. This is huge because uh, especially when you're, when you're talking, and I don't know if they have like an HTML5 interface or something that'll work on an iPad, but if, if it worked on the iPad and the kids could just explore, they would just lose themselves in an awesome world of me being able to play StarCraft and not having to pay attention to them at all. Yeah. No, that's good parenthood right there, let me tell you. I mean, seriously. You'll be better. You'll be better to your kids if you're allowed to do that. <laughs> and then finally, I got one more thing. Uh, this showed up here. This is, uh, this is one of the few Doctor Whos of the new ones that I saw all of the episode for. You remember the Don't Blink episode? Oh, uh, yeah. Stephen Moffat, the current executive producer, wrote that episode. It's like one of the quintessential episodes it's, in the reimagining it, of, or not reimagining, what, return it, it, of Doctor it, Who. It is to Doctor Who as the Hush episode is to Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Would you wow. agree with that? I have not seen the Hush episode of Buffy. Oh, I have not caught up. Right. Shame on you. I haven't done color. You got to watch. You got to watch. I'm getting there. Don't worry. Okay. Uh, but anyway, check this out. This is a mashup with the same idea. You even hear the doctor's voice, but it's mashed up with this cat video. Check it out. He starts off mouthing words. Like any other living creature, they freeze into rock. No choice. It's a fact of their biology. In the sight of any living thing, they literally turn to stone. And you can't kill a stone. Of course, a stone can't kill you either, but then you turn your head away. Then you blink. <laughs> oh, yes, it can. Your life could depend on this. Don't blink. Don't even blink. Blink and you're dead. <laughs> fast, faster than you can believe. Don't turn. Off. Don't look away. And don't blink. <laughs> <laughs> wow. It's gonna be funnier than it keeps being funny, right? You know, a cat video is so cliche, but every <laughs> once in a while, <laughs> once you combine it with uh, Doctor Who, you get yeah. awesome. Thanks for spoiling Buffy for me, by the way. Hey, you know what it's time for? Feedback. Now it's time for Feedback with Brian and Tom on Flame Radio, yeah. It is an ocean of feedback in here. I don't even know where to start. Well, here's what I did. I, I arranged all the similar emails. Some of them have different takes, but I arranged okay. them by category, and we'll just scattershot this thing. We'll just say as many or as few of them as we want. But the first episode right here, or first episode, first uh, first subject. It's going to be its own episode. It's so much. comes from Christopher Freeman, who says, Blu-ray plus DVD plus digital copy combo packs have become a regular occurrence for new release DVDs. But why is it that when a TV season is released on Blu-ray, nobody offers a combo with a digital copy. A quick Google search doesn't find any conversation around the topic. It's like nobody seems to notice. I've recently been very torn between buying my first seasons of shows through iTunes, through the ease of watching the episodes on multiple TVs and devices, rather than in the box off the shelf. But I feel gypped for not getting the physical media that also contains the bonus features. Why is no one raising this argument? Well, you, sir, are right now. I'll be honest. I didn't follow that. He wants to know why it is with movie DVDs, you can buy physical media and also get a digital copy as well. Okay. But you don't get to do that with TV DVDs. Because no one has gone to the trouble of licensing it that way. Okay. But, but his point is... He's confused why he's the only consumer who seems to want this. Nobody's even discussing this. He searched for people saying the same thing he's experiencing, but hasn't experienced That it. is so weird. But you know what? I don't really care either. John, John, John. <laughs> All right. Fine. <laughs> Uh, Chris says, I know it's been a few weeks since the announcement about Netflix doubling, excuse me, decoupling their pricing, but I've been waiting to see if you guys would address my biggest concern. With Blockbuster and other local video stores all but gone, Netflix seems to be the only viable source for Blu-ray discs. This is a huge consideration that no one seems to have mentioned. The convenience of streaming blows away the benefits of DVD, but Blu-ray looks and sounds so much better than streaming that I cannot just give it up. Is there some other source of Blu-ray goodness that I can tap into. Well, yeah, you can buy them. 
Uh, but that's a whole but, lot more expensive. Netflix yeah. has has done the same thing to Blu-ray that it's done to regular DVD, which is you you have you you'd have fewer choices now because there's Netflix. Uh, but Blockbuster has a it's rental system that does have Blu-ray. Um, there are a few other system, you know, smaller trading systems out there, uh, and there's still a few video stores. They haven't all gone out of business. The local mom and pops are actually doing better than the big chains in this case. Uh, that's interesting. But uh, I, I did think it was an interesting idea that somehow uh, Netflix was essentially working on a uh, a monopoly for, for yeah, Blu-ray. Yeah. Maybe that would be true for extra features, but I don't even know if they have the extra features on the Blu-ray discs uh, because they do offer HD streaming. So it's like the number one thing you want out of Blu-ray, which is HD, you can get from, from the streaming on there. True. Uh, okay, out of everything. We Although got, not as high a quality as you'll get out of a Blu-ray disc. Let's no, correct, yeah. correct. Yeah, no, Blu-ray is, is going to be your highest experience. Uh, but uh, we got so many responses. Remember last week we were talking about the idea of making an experiment out of the 40-year-old Star Wars virgin and a uh, number of these uh, came up. I'm going to read uh, two. Uh, let's just read the two shortest ones here. Um, Shaul says, hi, Brian and Tom. So Brian hypothesized that somebody watching Star Wars in chronological order would have the experience ruined for them. Well, you're right. The first proper experience I had with Star Wars was watching The Phantom Menace. And to be completely fair, after I caught up with the original trilogy, I failed to see what was awesome in those movies. Just for background, I was born in 1984 in the USSR, and only after I moved to Israel in 1990, I started to get exposed to the Western U.S. culture. So I can't even call him a youngster and say that's why he didn't enjoy it. Uh, and he, he came from the total outside, so I'm, I'm not surprised to hear I'm right. So in other words, he thinks having been spoiled would have made <laughs> him enjoy the first three movies better. Um, yes, sure. I think that's what he's saying. Although Doug writes in and said, I'm writing in response to your Star Wars chronological versus theatrical debate. No further experimentation needs to be done. I watched the Star Wars films in chronological order. It did not ruin the original films for me, as Brian predicted, but it obviously did spoil a lot, for instance, Luke's father. So I would suggest watching the films in theatrical order and just keep it that way. Yeah. Uh, let me just jump down. I think we got time for one more here. Yeah, pick it. Which one? Who uh, wins? I'll do this one that's in bold right here. Um, Brian Lorenzo says, Hello, Brian and Tom. First of all, I love your show. Frame Rate is my favorite show on the Twit Network. And second, I hate DVD movies. I'm sorry, HD movies is what he wrote. He hates Not really. HD movies. All right. We're... HD movies. Not really. I know that they added more makeup for certain TV entertainers to compensate for the high-resolution image, but what about when an actor or actress gets killed on screen? A lot of those scenes when a character is dead, when shown in HD, you can see them breathing, looking at their chest. I wonder how studios deal with that in the future. Make a mold of the character for props to expensive maybe CG character, or just train the actor actress not to breathe during the scene. And, uh, dude, I've run into that, too. Have you noticed that, where you catch little things like blinking corpses or breathing well, wait, corpses? wait, what does he mean about HD movies? Movies of, are in the same resolution they've always been in the theater. Yeah, does okay. he mean he when you watch a movie on television, you start to catch the things that you would no, catch no. in the theater? What, what he means, he said movies, but I think he's talking, the problem he's talking about, I believe, is talking about HD television. I mean, it, okay. you are correct. There should be no difference one way to the other. But, but I have noticed that on several television shows that by having them in HD, it's, it's too much. It's too close. It's too clear. You can see the seam in the makeup where the... Uh, well, where that, the, you know why? That, the problem with that is you have to do different kinds of makeup for different resolutions. And because they're shooting in a way that can still be watched in non-HD, right. a lot of times they, they're like, well, we'll look awful in, if it's not in HD, so we want to make sure that you know, it looks good in not HD, and then that's when you get that makeup seam going on. Because you think it's having... Um, it would uh, look fine. It would blur out in a lower resolution. You think we're just having growing pains Yeah, right now? yeah, I think so. Yeah, hey, we'll, not... we'll catch up. We'll get good. You get, you've been able to see people breathing who are dead in television and movies for years before HD. <laughs> The, the talent uh, level will rise eventually. Eventually. Or we just will decide that we don't care. It'll be like going to a play. Yeah, you know, exactly. You're dead anyway. You're just watching them breathe. You're like, we're pretending you're dead. Yeah. By the way, if you want to send feedback, it's frameratereshow at gmail.com. I am so happy with the quality and the content that we're getting. Just keep them short and to the point. And make sure to suggest stories that you'd like to see on the show as well. Thanks, everybody, uh, for watching Frame Rate. That's it for now. Uh, for Brian Brushwood, I'm Tom Merritt. And... 
I didn't believe hardly anything I was saying in the spoiler conversation. That's the twist. We'll see you next time. Oh, there was a twist!